is identity, who we are, how we think about ourselves, how we think about who we are and what we represent, right? Our ego, our status, our position in our group. And Miscavige was messing with the people who were at the very top of Scientology's pyramid of power. They were at the very, these are international executives and these are senior management people. These are veteran Sea Org members. These are people who worked with L. Ron Hubbard. So these guys have been around forever. They are old school, original OGs, right? And so Miscavige is threatening not just their job, not just a relationship, everything they've stood for, for the better part of their adult life. Mm -hmm is being threatened in that moment of I'm going to take it all away from you. And remember, the threat there was we're going to send you off. I've got airplane tickets purchased. We're going to ship you off all over the world and you're going to be the janitor in Australia. You know, you're going to we're going to ship you off to some podunk place in Canada and good luck ever, you know, hearing hearing from your family again. So this was the they were facing a total life lost you could say and that's why i think they fought tooth and nail it wasn't because they wanted to be with miscavige it was because they wanted their lives i want to bring introduce one and all to an old comrade and friend of mine Chris Shelton. Now, Chris, were you in like 35 years? Oh gosh, I'm at 27, kind of, you know, once I started doing courses and stuff and then worked for the church. So, but kind of all my life. So, <laughs> you know, there's that. Well, to say, say 35 years, I just want a numerical figure. Yes, I will say, let's say, oh. uh, yeah, since I was, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'd say 36, 37 years. Okay. So we have 37 years there and 40 years here. Now, the combination of that is <laughs> 77 years. I'm not good at math. You've got <laughs> yeah. 77 years of wisdom and experience of actually being in the cult. So pay attention. Chris knows whereof he speaks. And <laughs> getting 77 years of combined experience in this video. First time I used to, many people don't know this, but I grabbed Chris way early on and I did a few videos with him, which right. were very well received. Yes. Yeah. The very first time I appeared on video was on your channel. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We launched you. Right. Now they say a picture is worth a thousand thousand words. Chris and I are going to discuss. I'm going to lean on Chris how a cult with great promises is worth three billion dollars yeah. never mind me worth a power one power. <laughs> great promises great shenanigans and there is as chris has explained on his channel which i'm going to be linking you here which i want my audience to visit it's incredibly educational on how you are coercively controlled and indoctrinated. Chris breaks it down step by step, baby steps, inch by inch. And I wanted to um, I wanted to launch into an incident which is an example of cult conduct. And then I want Chris to dissect it, bisect it and explain how can that be? So this is what I want to launch into. Yeah. In 1977, Hubbard decided that if you wiggle jiggle and the needle goes frantic on the e-meter, you have e evil in your soul. You're a rock, 
what he called a rock slammer. Yeah. Now, notwithstanding that the cult draws you in by saying, man is basically good, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're, you're, you have goodness. This is a dichotomy. <laughs> you're not good at the needle when frantic, you are evil. And in 1977, for one year forward in time, all the execs of the church were hurled into or ordered into hard manual labor, which they needed because they just bought the Cedars complex and they were RPF'd. Chris, you take over. Yeah, good old RPF. This was Hubbard's brainchild back on the boat, actually on the ship, when um, which which you were there at the when when the, the birth of this thing, if I, if I remember right. right, and it was and it was this really weird idea where um, didn't I think they originally called it the Mud Box Brigade or something, <laughs> and uh, and and you kind of get this idea of Mud Box, what you know, yeah, it was hard work. It was like get in there, get dirty. We don't really care. You deserve it because you have sinned. You are, a, you know, you're you're acting with with malice, with evil. And this was Hubbard's ultimate way of punishing or or oppressing people who he thought were somehow lost the plot or were working against the organization or something. And he, unfortunately, during the 1970s, Hubbard's mental state deteriorated and there were physical problems. I think he had a heart attack or various issues and, and, um, and he was getting pretty paranoid. And we, we hear about this from his auditor at the time, David Mayo and other people who were going through his folders and various things. And, and, uh, and so this paranoia and this program, this RPF, which was, you know, sort of sold as a rehabilitation program, you get a little vacation, get a little time away, get yourself back together, get back to work. That became this very oppressive program of, of discipline and hard work and, and really blaming the victim kind of approach where, you know, you screw up on something and it's assumed in Scientology and by L. Ron Hubbard and the Sea Org that you meant to do that, that you did that on purpose, that there must be some evil intention yeah. at the bottom of that. And that evil intention has to be rooted out like a cavity. You know, you got to get in there and dig it out. And originally they were doing what was called expanded Dianetics for that. And then they developed in the 80s this, this other kind of thing called the False Purpose Rundown. But it was just Scientology auditing that people were supposed to do on each other. But the real, the real bonus, the real benefit of having this program was it was a labor detail. It was, it was labor trafficking. It's turning people into <laughs> slaves. And that's the that net effect of this was not a rehabilitation program. It was a slave labor camp. And I I did it. You know, you were you've seen yeah. it and been around it. Uh, it I was, I was yeah. So, you know, it was it was never fun. <laughs> it was never a good time. And uh, it took me three years to get through through my program. The, the, you know, it's the, the contents of the program have changed over the years. But the one thing that never changed about it was that hard physical labor was most of the program. Yes. And and that makes it a labor trafficking program because you're talking about people, by the way, who are not, you know, they're being paid pennies per hour. You could say for the work they're doing. I mean, I, I, I when I was on the RPF, it was eleven dollars a week max that you were gonna that you were gonna do what was that the deal when you did it back in the well uh, in in my running program uh, i don't i don't think you got even five dollars <laughs> it was quarter pay or something some such for, and these are 50 70 or 80 hour weeks i did the running i was forced to run 12 hours a day in three months of my running program. but chris what i want you to do yeah. You and I are old vets. Let, I want you to examine the obedience, all these topic sex. Oh, absolutely. And we're obedient to the fact that this needle jiggling yeah. made them evil. Yeah. Can you comment on that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. And this was the crazy part is there's this there's this e-meter, right, that, that is utilized in Scientology and it's got this needle and it. And like you mentioned, it jiggles around on the dial and and there's this thing called a rock slam. It's a response that supposedly occurs in the presence of an evil intention and the needle goes insane. It just bounces and slams back and forth on the dial as though the needle as though the meter looks like it's broken well I, I, this is my conclusion this is my th my take on this but my take it is because it is broken i've seen it and i've talked to many many other people who saw one of these rock slams and we all kind of concluded it was because the meter was broken it used to get dust inside the 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 pot and it would just go crazy and that could happen, you know, for many, many, many years forward. It was a, it was this problem, and people believed though that because L. Ron Hubbard said, yes. "Oh, this reaction Bingo. is an evil intention." Bingo! Oh Bingo. my God! You know. You see, in you know that I did counseling for years, Chris. Yes. I did the elves morning, noon, and night for years, yeah. on and on. In my experience, when the 50% at least were just metering, like you said, dust and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the common denominator I found when that happened was the person simply had inner conflict. This mm -hmm. is if you believe the meter at all this. <laughs> sure, sure. The meter is. But con and conflict made sense because the mind is conflicted and opposing, you know, even conflict and sitting and being forced to be sex checked where uh, the so-called rock slam turned out, you're in, you don't even want to be there holding this. This, this is just, so conflict can, in, in my experience, conflict was on a small percentage, but a lot of the percentage was simply a loose meter cable, anything like that with an electrical pulse going through. Could call, anyway, Aside from that, I just want to look at the human aspect. Absolutely. The way people obeyed, Chris. Yeah. We all obeyed. We, we believed if Hubbard said that, then if Hubbard pronounced us as evil, we we believed it. Huh? That's right. That's exactly right. This is, the, and this is really the hardest part for people to understand is the, is the compliance factor yes um but it's real it's true right people will do or believe anything if you give them a good enough reason to yes. and in scientology the reason is you're an immortal spiritual being live forever you've accumulated all kinds of trauma and bad experiences and part of those bad experiences includes evil intentions and you go well that's plausible that makes sense from a scientologist point of view it makes total sense and so they buy into that and they believe, therefore, that it must be their evil intentions that cause them to make mistakes, screw up, do bad things. And Hubbard leans on this. This is a guilt mechanism that Hubbard just pounded on with people mm -hmm. is he would make them guilty even when they weren't guilty. And you mm -hmm. get this kind of group thing that happens where we all started believing that we were fully responsible for everything that ever happened to us, no matter what the cause of it was. It didn't matter if you walked up and hit me one day, I must have done something to pull it in, you know, that, that whole thing, right? And that's, that's powerful stuff when an entire group of people believe that is true. Mm -hmm. And that's a really key part of this is it's not just you personally thinking and believing this. Everybody around you believes it too. And so it's this self, it's this kind of group reinforcing idea. And what that leads to is this kind of slave mentality where everything that happens to you, you know, that's bad or is abusive well, you kind of deserved it. You kind of pulled it in. It's on you. It's your responsibility that all this is happening to you. And that's the culture of the Sea Organ of Scientology in general. And it's really, it's, it's, that's one of the most destructive things about it from the, from that person, you know, that group perspective. Well spoken, Chris. Beautifully spoken in a few paragraphs. 
I want to I want to take your take on something that spontaneously I just thought of. Mm -hmm. A big argument, especially with people on the fence, and I talk to a lot of people who are sort of hung up in doubt was the expression we yeah. would use in the culture. Right. How could something so bad, so abusive, so coercive have all these followers just loyal and how could they just be so willing to take that kind of punishment, lose all their funds, to take out a second trust deed and lose it? How could that be? And I'm going to tell you my opinion. Yeah, what do you think? I absolutely want your wisdom and your 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 input. And even if it's sword fencing and even if it's <laughs> <laughs> you not know, mine. When a person has any kind of high, even just say on weed, on marijuana, on alcohol, or, mm -hmm. or a person being let out of prison after 14 years goes on a high, this is freedom. There's, there's, there's a spiritual high that occurs. Yep. When that occurs, a human being gets addicted to wanting that. A very good example, when I was in Las Vegas with Janice Grady uh, a few years ago, I won out the roof on on craps, rolling the dice. I just yeah. won one and one. And people started joining the table, female, female shooter, meaning a girl rolling the dice. And, and I kept wondering, I got a high. I can just make a roll of it. Yeah. Now, I gave it all back to the casino plus some in a subsequent visit because I knew that I wanted that that high and that attention of everyone. Look at her. She just rolled 7-Eleven, blah, blah, blah. So this is my theory. Yeah. In very lower levels, a person can get high. They can do a TR course and they feel in they can have a, a high where they feel invincible, they feel immortal, and doesn't matter what happens in the next five years, they want that want that win again. Yeah. So the reason they keep going is they got that hook. The hook was one pretty good win in harmless lower level stuff. And and when you, it's cathartic, cathartic when you unload yourself the first time to someone right. who gives undivided attention, you can't have a win. So my theory on why they keep going and going, um, people are willing to take an awful lot of pain for just a little bit of high. That's right. The heroin junkie will go, they, they're losing their teeth and every half, they've got to have that high. The high becomes an addictive. Now, I want your input and comments on my theory. Absolutely. Seeking the high. Yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think chasing the high is absolutely part of this. And you're, and you're absolutely right that there is this awe experience, mm -hmm. this, you know, this, this, this experience. euphoria. It's, it's, it's like falling in love. It's amazing. It feels so good. Right. And, and, and it doesn't have to, you know, it could also be a series of them uh, that not necessarily that big, but together they, you know, they impact your life in a very positive way. And you're like, wow, this feels great. I want more of this. I will add to that. Let me know what you think about this. But I think when it comes to the level of indoctrination we experienced when the Sea Org where we went all in billion year contracts and, you know, lifetime commitment and uh, all the abuse we suffered RPFs. I think when you get to that level, there's an, there's an added layer on top of the high. I think everything you said is a hundred percent valid. That's what hooks all of us into it. Keeps us going back, keeps us paying money for the Sea Org. When you were recruited, I know when I was recruited, I want to ask you, when I was recruited, it had everything to do with purpose, mm -hmm. saving the world, right? Saving the, clearing the planet, right? We were going to bring this high, this, this level of amazement to everybody. Mm -hmm. And it was going to change the world forever. 
<laughs> for me, that was a real big part of it too, because purpose is what drives your intention, right? Keeps you going and, and gives you a direction. And I, I thought that's, that's part of that because you will take exactly like you said, you will take so much abuse to get what you might think is a little bit of gain in the direction you want to go in, right? Chasing that high, clearing the planet, trying to move that on the road, you know? I don't know. What do you think? No, absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you, because people don't understand. Let me throw another little anecdote at you for your insights and opinions. Yeah. When the story broke on interbase musical chairs, Yes. It was a gruesome, horrible nightmare incident, a horror incident. But people were, at two in the morning, they were having to fight over a chair to a Queen's, uh, what was the Queen's? Uh, oh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody in the middle of the night, right. punching each other, breaking chairs. This is, this, this is Seog, Lord of the Flies. Uh, oh, it was, it was and yeah. here's the thing, Chris. They were fighting to stay. They didn't see this as a way out. That's right. Now, over to you. How, like, we, we just discussed why they would want to stay seeking the heart, but can you imagine not taking advantage of getting out of Miscavige's clutches and fighting to not be thrown out of that? Please explain. Absolutely. There's there's another layer to this. It's, you know, everything we've said so far. And then on top of that, there's another layer, which is identity. Mm. Who we are, how we think about ourselves, how we think about who we are and what we represent. Mm. Right. Our ego, our status, our position in our group. And Miscavige was messing with the people who were at the very top of Scientology's pyramid of power. They were at the very, these are international executives. And these are senior management people. These are veteran Sea Org members. These are people who worked with L. Ron Hubbard. Mm -hmm. So these guys have been around forever. They are old school, original OGs, right? And so Miscavige is threatening not just their job, not just a relationship, Everything they've stood for, for the better part of their adult life, mm -hmm. is being threatened in that moment mm -hmm. of, I'm going to take it all away from you. And remember, the threat there was, we're going to send you off. I've got airplane tickets purchased. We're going to ship you off all over the world. And you're going to be the janitor in Australia. You know, you're going to, we're going to ship you off to some podunk place in Canada. And good luck ever, you know, hearing, hearing from your family again. So this was the, they were facing a total life loss, you could say. And that's why I think they fought tooth and nail. It wasn't because they wanted to be with Miscavige. Yeah. It was because they wanted their lives, yeah. you know, and he held it in his palm. I mean, it was such a sick joke he played on them because he didn't end up sending any of them off. He just wanted to watch them scurry like little ants in front of him. And he really gets off on that kind of thing. It's a, it's a sickness. It really is a personality disorder. Yeah. Well spoken. That was, that was, that was very good analysis. All this throwing when they had to throw themselves in the feces lake full of bacteria, yeah. like the obedience, the, the compliance, it, yeah. it's just mind boggling because when you are in, you wouldn't even think of mutiny. That's Who right. Who would that and said, you know, get lost. This is not what I signed up for. This is, mm -hmm. they just complied. Do you remember that incident of uh, 20 people were getting sick from being thrown in the lake? So then it became the swimming pool. But it would be at 2 in the morning when it's freezing cold out in the desert. And they would be fully dressed. And they had to walk the diving board and drop into the pool, but they were not allowed towels to dry themselves. Did you know right. that one? Right. They had to shiver in their uniform. So Miscavige could just order that you fling yourself into the pool 
at two in the morning. Chris, we come from, we come from, it's just, you know, when someone first called it a mafia cult, I thought, eh, that's exactly. But this is, this is religion gone mad. Very much so. Church? Very much so. Ecclesiastical? Yeah. No, these are not people who are making the world a better place. And they, you know, and that's the problem is they all think they are. I mean, it's such a, it's such a bubble world of, uh, uh, you know, there really is like a wall between the reality of Scientologists and the reality of the real world. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's, and it's, I think it's hardest in a way for the public to walk that line because they're right there in the real world going to jobs, going to school, going and doing this and that. And they have to constantly play mental gymnastics to make this bubble world nonsense make sense. The Sea Org members and the staff to a lesser degree, they're all in on that. That's all, that's their whole world. And, and, and so you see what happens in the Sea Org is kind of the most pure version of Scientology. It's un, it's unfiltered by all that outside stuff, you know? And so you see the most awful things happening within the Sea Org because that's the concentrated pure Scientology. And unfortunately, concentrated pure Scientology, at least at a group level, is awful. It's, it's, it's disciplinary. It's, it's trafficking. It's, it's, it's it's victim blaming. It's it, you know it's very traumatizing and, and very abusive. Absolutely, and all the time you're being told it's a madhouse out there. Yes, we are an island of safety. <laughs> <laughs> but the contradictions are part of the package. It's it's crazy how you are exactly told this is the most ideal world you're ever going to live in, and you're like, really. You know, and it's just, it, no, this is not the most ideal world. This is insaneville. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes in the darkest hours of the morning, right, you know, you could kind of think that to yourself and then be like, oh, no, I can't be thinking that way. That's awful of me. I can't. No, this is paradise. And it's me. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. <laughs> and that's how you keep yourself going. And it's, a, and again, it's just this really sick inversion. It's this twist, you know, this mental twist and it's awful. Right on the nose. You know, Chris, I, I, I always like to keep my, my videos short and, but this was my, can we do part two on this? Because I yeah. haven't, I haven't, we'll end off on part one. Now, I want the world to know that Chris Shelton rolled up his sleeve, studied very hard and got a master's degree. And so he's Chris Shelton. <laughs> he has a master's degree and he wants to go further. Mm -hmm. A lot further than do these educational videos. He's available for consultancy. You have to pay. No free. <laughs> pay. Pay. I'm so blessed to be a Top Gun dealer. In I don't. I don't. I'm not a, a site that asks for payment. But Chris has to pay bills. And I encourage you to join a patron or if you need his services in any way to help help you with someone who's gotten all messed up and not really, they've departed. Anyway, I, I won't give you Chris's <laughs> list, but I just wanted to, you to know if he's availability. He's, you're licensed as a clinical psychologist, no? Oh, no, no, no. Let's be clear. I am definitely not. A oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I have a degree in I have a master's degree in the psychology of coercive control, which is an academic degree. And that puts me in a position where I can consult with people about relationships with cult members, how to get somebody out of a cult, how to do cult recovery. But I'm not a therapist. Okay, okay, good, okay. I'm so fuzzy on that whole area. I don't know, uh, I don't know the uh, definitions. I know the definitions are all a little, you can't do them well. But consultancy, your brilliant curse, you lived and breathed it. You definitely deserve some gravy after all you <laughs> you, Thank you. You, 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 you were second generation. There was no power of choice. Your mom, you were reeled in as a child right. and doing stuff. So I think you could understand and have the empathy 
that a lot of people wouldn't. So I want to do part two. Great. Chris, I want to thank you. This was we you gave some hard pieces of wisdom. Well done, Chris. Well done. Thank you. And thank you, Karen, for doing this work, by the way. You know, it's it's all of us doing this that has created the effects that we've created, you know, and and that and that's important. You know, it's it's my whatever, 37 years, it's your 40 years, you know, it's, it's your hard work on this, too. So I want to validate the hell out of you for for persisting and doing everything you've done. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, yeah, it really it. It takes a village. There's yeah. so, there's so many of us. Aaron is a knockout with his videos. Yeah. There's more and more voices. Mike Rinder's book will be out in what ten days or twenty. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. I bet you're going to do a knockout video on that. Mm. I can't wait to. <laughs> Lots of love to you, Chris. You Thank and you your real wife. Take care, and I will see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody, for staying right to the end of this, this video. Chris Shelton, MSC. Bye-bye, everyone.